Hey, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Amy Starczewski and I'm the Associate Director of the Oral History MA program here at Columbia. Um, tonight's event is the last event of the semester in our ongoing uh, oral history workshop series and the topic this year is oral history and public dialogue. Um, so we've had all different kinds of artists and scholars and activists um, with us this semester to talk about all the different ways that they take uh, you know, very long involved oral history interviews and translate them for a public audience in a way that's meant to engage um, some of the important issues of our time. Um, so when I was putting the series together, I uh, thought about the work of Erica Wrightson, who's a recent alum of our program. Um, in the, her thesis was on the changing uh, role of narrative in jazz, and she interviewed Miguel for that, but she also, uh, for our spring fieldwork class last year, um, reviewed this album um, as part of an assignment to uh, critically review some piece of public-facing oral history work, and that's how I learned about uh, Miguel's really uh, wonderful work. Uh, so Eric is here tonight to introduce Miguel, and I'll turn it over to her in a second uh, to tell you a little bit more about her. She's a writer, editor, and oral historian based in Los Angeles, and a 2015 graduate of Columbia's Oral History MA program. For her thesis, she interviewed a number of jazz musicians, club owners, and educators about the shift of narrative in jazz over time. And in September, she started a new job as the managing editor of publications at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. So congratulations. And thank you. All right. Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here. It's good to see some familiar cohort faces. <laughs> Um, so I'm just going to give you guys a little bit of background on Miguel and a bit also about my uh, thesis work. Um, the title of my thesis was Gathered Time Hearing Change in Jazz. And for my thesis I focused on the shift of narrative in jazz over time. I interviewed 10 musicians about their education and looked at how emotion and story are conveyed in their music. I wondered if the introduction of jazz studies into the university setting affected expression in music, emphasizing technical skill and memorization over creativity. My older interviewees voiced a strong concern that younger musicians miss the storytelling aspect of jazz, something not easily taught in a classroom. Many of them learned how to play from musicians in their neighborhoods where music poured out of small clubs and basements. The history of their jazz education is written in their sound. Oral history, like jazz, is a malleable and generous genre. It expects and accommodates change. Akin to musicians, oral history narrators give us information about people or social groups whose written history is either missing or distorted. As musical creativity rejects oppression, so oral sources challenge linear historical narratives infusing them through polyphony with life. As Robert G. O'Mealy says in his introduction to a collection of Ralph Ellison's jazz writings, jazz artists are singers of the self and historians of levels of American experience not recorded otherwise. Jazz is an archive in itself, a form of living history. Scholar Kevin Gaines says that both jazz and oral history quote, preserve an embattled collective memory of oppression and struggle against those forces dedicated to erasing it from the public sphere. For musicians and audiences, jazz as a repository of cultural memory offers the potential to make a difference, that is, literally crafting it musically while undermining oppressive differences, end quote. Jazz's fluid compositional structure, buoyed by improvisation, channels a narrative of freedom through raw sound. As bass player Charles Mingus explained to writer Nat Hentoff, in my music, I'm trying to play the truth of what I am. The reason it's difficult is because I'm changing all the time. Identity, like jazz, is elastic, challenged and reinforced by those we live with and live without. The concept drives identities are changeable. The latest album from Puerto Rican-born, New York-based saxophonist, composer, band leader, producer, and educator, Miguel Zinan. For the project, Zanon interviewed seven fellow Puerto Rican transplants about their ethnic and national associations and their perceptions of home, and then wrote music around and through their voices. The result is an ethnography of New Yorican experience that traces the intricacies of identity and belonging. 
The project was inspired by The Diaspora Strikes Back, a book by the late NYU professor of social and cultural analysis and director of Latino studies, Juan Flores. In it, Flores dives into the ongoing Dominican and Caribbean diaspora process through interviews with people from Puerto Rico, Cuba, and the Dominican Republic. Flores writes about ambivalence and divided loyalties of cultural remittances, the ensemble of ideas, values, and expressive forms introduced into societies of origin by re-migrants and their families as they return home, he says, sometimes for the first time. Both Flores and Zinon explore what it means to be Puerto Rican, but more broadly, definitions of home and how we belong. Through the voices and identities are changeable, we learn that this is a complex process shaped not only by self-identification, but by the language, opinions, and behaviors of the communities in which we live, a choreography of human perception, experience, and time. The narrative of Zinon's interviews is carried by the warm voice of his saxophone, backed by the Identity's big band, a 12-piece brass ensemble. The first track, De Donde Vienes, serves as an overture for the six-part song cycle in which each interviewee reveals their name and place of birth while the band swells behind, an attentive audience or a village, a familial sound lifting them up. And you guys will get to hear a bit of that music pretty soon. The album celebrates the freedom and explores the limitations of identity as tied to place. One interviewee talks about being perceived as black because of his non-whiteness and about identifying more with the difference that other people seem to define him by than with his proximity to them. Another admits he feels little connection to his parents' homeland and doesn't speak Spanish or know exactly where they're from. Being Puerto Rican didn't really matter to me, he says. For others, Puerto Rico is inherently home, a core part of who they are, even though they have never set foot in the island. As the Puerto Rican poet and performance artist Mariposa says in her poem, Ode to a Diasporican. No nasi en Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico nació en mí. I wasn't born in Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico was born in me. Sinan's voice surfaces through his horn and when he asks questions, tell me your name, where you were born and raised, and where your family is from, but we never hear his personal story. That's because this is not a work of memoir, but a portrait of a community. In an interview with Zinon in the spring, he told me that music was a, was a part of daily life in Puerto Rico. And this is a quote from our interview. You hear music all the time, in the street, on street corners, in the store, he said. Even within my own family, my mom would be singing all day and my dad played a little percussion. I had an uncle who played bass. It was never like I would go see, a, see someone play. Music was just part of life. And now that I think about it, it was super subliminal. It was just there all the time, and all my family is musically inclined. They can sing, keep time, and they're good with rhythm. Miguel was born in San Juan, Puerto Rico in 1976. He describes the neighborhood he grew up in as rough, but his family is protective and close. When his parents separated, his father moved permanently to New York City. He recalled as a child visiting his father and other family members from Puerto Rico who had made their lives there. I was shocked about this idea that people spoke my language, they ate the same food, but then you looked outside and it looked different. Some people were speaking different languages. I was like, what's going on, he said. From a young age, Zanon studied music. At school, he sang in choir and played recorder. When classmates told him that there was a guy from another neighborhood teaching music fundamentals and theory to kids in his community, Zanon's grandmother enrolled him in lessons. For years, Zinon studied with Ernesto Figaro in the residential Luis Lorenz Torres, a housing project where he spent most of his childhood. His plans to join the neighborhood marching band changed when he was accepted into Escuela Libre, Libre de Musica, a middle and high school for performing arts where he studied classical saxophone for the next six years. Although he enjoyed playing in ensembles, Zinon said, he didn't consider becoming a professional musician until he discovered jazz through Charlie Parker tapes passed around by his friends. I was blown away, he said, and became really kind of obsessed with understanding what was going on. That changed the course of my life from that point on, and I decided that that's what I wanted to do. Zinon moved, from the States, moved to the States, where he earned a bachelor's degree in jazz studies from Berklee School of Music and a master's in jazz performance from Manhattan School of Music just across the street. He has been a, the recipient of Guggenheim and MacArthur Fellowships. 
a founding member and band leader of the SF Jazz Collective, Zanon is also an educator and cultural ambassador. In 2011, he founded a free public jazz concert series in rural areas of Puerto Rico. And I'd like to introduce Miguel. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for having me. Um, I apologize in advance. I'm not a very loud speaker, so um, let me know if you can hear, and I'll try to speak louder. <laughs> um, I think the plan that I had was, um, and, and I spoke to Erica about it uh, beforehand, was to play a couple of the tracks from the uh, from the recording from this project, Identities Are Changeable, which we've been talking about. Uh, and uh, this project involves not only music, but also, of course, the, the video and audio from these interviews. It also involves this video installment that was created for the project specifically by an artist named David Dempelwolf. And um, my idea was to uh, play you a couple of tracks, not the entire track, because they're kind of long. I edited some of the tracks. Uh, and maybe explain a little bit of what I did and uh, sort of the reasoning behind it, both sort of musical and also kind of conceptual uh, that has to do with this project. The first one I wanted to play for you was the one that uh, Erica mentioned earlier, that Donde Vienes means where, where do you come from? And uh, on all the, when I conducted these interviews, um, like I mentioned earlier in our meeting we had, we had early on, um, I pretty much asked everyone the same questions. You know, I had a series of questions that had to do with specific subjects and specific things. Some of the questions vary depending on who I was speaking to. If it was a musician, then I would ask them specific musical questions, or if it was a academic, then I would go, I would go there a little bit. Uh, but for the most part, there were mostly the same questions, and, and the first question I would ask them was this question, you know, uh, can you tell me where you were born and raised and, and, and where your family is from? Of course, everyone who I interviewed on this project uh, someone of their family, be it both of their parents or their grandparents or maybe one of their parents, uh, is from Puerto Rico, and that's kind of what, what ties them to, to this whole thing. And for me, it wasn't just trying to identify each voice, you know, and each, each individual to the listener, but also um, sort of about, about making this point of, of, uh, that was is made later on in some of the other, some of the other tracks that they, they sort of belong in, in different places, right? I mean, they're born here, but the parents are from there. They're, they're very, most of them, anyway, they're, they're very clear about where, where their roots are, you know, which, which town their parents are from, when, they, when did they come to the United States, and all that stuff. So this is what this track is, and it sort of, it sort of uh, functions also as a, as a musical overture. So on this track, which is the first track on the recording, there are, there are snippets like like uh, musical fragments of every piece that is part of the project. So every every piece is sort of presented, as well as all the all the uh, interviewees. So um, yeah, I need a little help <laughs> finding the. Uh, yeah, yeah. Should we leave them? We don't need to leave them up. You were just testing them, right? Yeah. Okay. That's the first one. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There's video with it too, right? Yeah. Display on. Okay. Great. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Father is Puerto Rican from the old school. Uh, he was born in 1900. Uh, and 
you heard that, I um, want to give you a little background, and, and again, we've spoken a little bit about this earlier, but about the individuals that I ended up interviewing for the project. When I, um, when I went into this, uh, the, the kind of like tackled the idea for this project, I went into it without really any previous experiences, any experience of, of interviewing or, or this kind of thing, you know, I really just kind of went into it because I was curious. Uh, as a Puerto Rican, born and raised there, but living here in the United States for a very long time, I was curious about what it felt like to uh, to have the other side of it, you know, to be someone who's who's born and raised here, specifically in New York, where the Puerto Rican community is so present and so large, and so, so it has such a historical thing going on in the city. And I wanted to see what what it felt like, you know, I wanted to know more about what it felt like, sort of having these layers of identity. As a New Yorker and as Puerto Rican, first, second generation, that kind of thing. So I basically I reached out to everyone that I knew who sort of fit this mold, who was born and raised in and around New York, but of Puerto Rican roots. And uh, basically, the people that got back to me were the folks that ended up making it into the project. So I ended up interviewing seven seven individuals. 
uh, all of them, for the most part, I knew them pretty well. You know, some family members, fellow musicians. Uh, I interviewed my sister, Patricia, uh, who was born here in the Bronx. Um, I interviewed a couple of musicians, Lucas Curtis, an amazing jazz bass player uh, who plays with everybody, you know, uh, from Eddie Palmieri to some of the biggest jazz names around. Uh, Camilo Molina, who's an amazing percussionist, who also plays with Eddie, but who's, uh, who was born and raised in, in El Barrio in East Harlem, started playing music when he was five years old, started playing percussion. So music was sort of like his way of, you know, finding his, his road as a Puerto Rican individual. Uh, Juan Flores, um, who was mentioned before, Juan and his book, The Diaspora Strikes Back, was sort of the catalyst to the project. And, and pretty much the reason why I went into this whole thing. Uh, uh, Bonafide Rojas, who's uh, actually a friend of my brother and sister, who eventually became a good friend of mine. He's, uh, he's amongst other things, he's a New Yorkian poet. Uh, he's been doing a lot of things uh, in the city, from you know having rock band to you know doing poetry slams for a very long time. Uh, also raised around the corner from where my brother and sister grew up here in the Bronx. Um, Alejandro Rodriguez Alex, he's actually a friend of, of the family, of, uh, closer to my wife. Uh, and I ended up interviewing him because he's, uh, his parents were really close to my, my wife's parents. And I, he kind of fed them all, but uh, from, from another side of it, he grew up on the Upper East Side. Very close to Spanish Harlem, but he kind of had both sides of the, the thing too. Uh, and uh, Sonia Manzano, uh, who uh, for, for a very long time played Maria on Sesame Street. Uh, and he's, uh, she, she, I met her basically at shows. She, she comes to all the shows. She's a big fan of music and she's got, always coming out to support us. So I reached out to her and she said yes. I was very happy. Um, so I'm going to play you another track now. This, this next track I'm going to play for you is actually the, the title track to the, uh, the project. Identities are changeable. When, when I first uh, put the project together, I didn't really have a title and it sort of went, you know, uh, uh, I went through a few different titles, and eventually, I sort of settled on this title because it's a quote from 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 once interview, and I really felt that this this phrase, this this quote, and this idea of identity being something that could have different layers, that could change, and could be uh, something that that didn't necessarily have to be static. At least in the case of of what we're talking about here, it really resonated, you know, with me, and it really. I really felt that this was what the project was about, you know. And, and, uh, since the beginning of the thing, of the project, uh, the interviews were, were th that was the center. So these individuals are really the protagonists. They're, they're, they're like, you know, they're the main thing. The music is sort of complementing uh, what they're saying and talking about and everything that's going around, you know, going on on the project. But it's really all about what they're saying and, and this idea of, of what they're trying to portray. Um, another thing I wanted to mention was that uh, when I first uh, conducted the interviews and I was trying to figure out how I wanted to write the music, you know, when I decided that I wanted to write music around the interviews, at uh, first I wanted to write, write a piece of music for each individual. You know, I, I wanted to write a piece that would represent each specific interview. Uh, and then eventually I realized that because a lot of the questions were the same and uh, a lot of the subjects, the stuff that we ended up talking about was pretty much the same stuff, you know. Um, not saying the same thing, but it was the same themes. So I decided that I wanted to write a, a, a piece of music for each uh, one of those themes, you know. And uh, one of those themes, or the main theme, was this theme of identity, uh, which is kind of like, uh, is how this, this track, Identity is Unchangeable, is put together. Um, something that I also, also mentioned before, was that the way I wrote this music, uh, whenever I write music, I, um, I sort of need to have something that is not, uh, that is more concrete, like a sort of concrete idea that's gonna tie everything together. And when I'm working on a specific project and it's got a few different pieces, I want something to, I, I, want, I want to have like a unifying concept that sort of ties everything together. And I was trying to come up with something for this project and, and it, it was especially hard because it wasn't something. The idea for the project it wasn't it, it wasn't coming out of a musical source, right? It was some, coming out of somewhere else. 
So, um, but I started thinking about this idea of, of identity and uh, this idea of layers and, and thinking about rhythm, you know, and how, how, how rhythm, which is something that I'm sort of obsessed about anyway, um, could, could serve as a, a, as a representative of this idea, whereas you could have various rhythmic structures uh, like coexisting in the same space, like within the same entity, which, which is kind of like what I felt when I was speaking to a lot of them. It was like a lot of times, even throughout their lifetime, they, they felt like they had a specific identity and then that would change and sometimes one identity would become like more, would come to the forefront, the other one would be more in the background, and then it would switch. Uh, and I, I thought that I could sort of represent this using rhythm. Uh, so all the pieces on the, on the, uh, on the project are written, are written from this point of view, this musical point of view. I, 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 create, I, I incorporated specific rhythmic, like, a, like sort of rhythmic counterpoint, if you will, you know. Like you could say there's this figure, just to give you like a really basic example, but this is like really, uh, like, uh, I really would like for you to get a, like a simple grasp about what I'm talking about, even if you're, you're not a musician. Um, uh, the, the most basic sort of, sort of way you could represent is this by putting three and two together, right? Three against two, that would be the ratio. And you would put them in the same space. And if I tap, um, let me see, if I tap three on this hand and two on this hand, it sounds kind of like this. This is three. This is two. And they kind of fall in the same space. So when I was writing this music, I was thinking about it in the sense like this, each one of this, this rhythmic structure is an identity. And then I go back and forth, you know? Like for example, this, this track, identities are changeable. The, 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 the track started with this idea of putting like a figure that had, that had like five in it with a figure that had seven in it and then putting three on top of that and created this sort of rhythmic counterpoint that carries through out the tune pretty much from top to bottom, top to bottom in different, from different perspectives, you know? So I'll play the track for you and then talk a little bit. Um, okay. Right here, right? Yeah.
is only one aspect of things. And language is only one aspect of things. And actually, it's like we don't really use the word I'm American. I always say that I'm New Yorker or New Yorkian. Um, I just don't really identify with being completely American because my roots were kind of just so soiled in from the beginning. My Spanish was always my first language. I think that the uh, Puerto Ricans, um, uh, they, they often, the first days will be on the Puerto Rican, Puerto Rican. They don't say not Puerto Rican American, Puerto Rican. They don't think the Gentile. The separation of nationalistic identity from the Puerto Rican race is very much a separation of race. The Puerto Rican nationalistic identity is very much a separation of race. The end of the day, the umbrella of, of Latinidad and, and Latino can, can resolve. play for you is a track called First Language and um, one of the biggest I think one of the biggest clashes historically uh, between the uh, community here and the community in Puerto Rico of course has been the idea of language the issue of language and one of the you know the first things you hear uh, when people speak uh, speak kind of down in the community here they go like you know they, they don't even speak Spanish they, you know it's like that's it's a different language, so they're not really, you know, Puerto Rican, and that's kind of like one of the main one of the main things they use to kind of like, you know, dismiss the idea of this community having like a, like a significance, right? Uh, in terms of what it means to be Puerto Rican, and uh, I was really interested in this idea, um, not only because of the historical context, but also our family here, you know, my sister and my brother, and a lot of family from my father's side who, who spent time here, and also from my mother's side. Actually, my mom lived here as a young kid too. Which is was very common for people in her generation, and I was really, uh, I was really curious about the reason, uh, about the why. You know why uh, some people kind of took it up to really like you know I, I really want to speak Spanish and I I want to I want to I want to be able to speak it. And some people they told them it didn't matter to them. You know, and it, it, it wasn't like like it made them less of less connected to it to the fact that they were Puerto Rican. It was just like you know that's not really part of what it is to me, and I was really curious about it, and uh, and basically that this is what that track sort of represents. Uh, interesting, uh, interesting thing about this track, the way it was put together musically, is that uh, in terms of the layers of rhythm that I was talking about before, the, the core of it is coming out of the same place that that other track came from. So it, it's kind of like a five and a seven put together, but it's uh, it's faster, so it feels a little different, but it's the same kind of idea. Let me see if I can find it here without that. Was it full screen? Yes. Yeah. Just on 
on having to communicate with my family and not want to, that to be that barrier kind of made, made me and, and, and helped me understand the language. My grandmother speaks a little bit in English, like it's like, you know, that I have to always speak to her brand broken down English. Um, and of course, I would love to relate to her. I love to talk to her and just find out everything I can know about her. But yeah, it's, I guess it's easy to something out. Um, 
So this this uh, this last track that I was gonna, I wanted to play for you, it's uh, it's got a little bit of a backstory behind it. This personal thing. Um, I guess I, I would have to mention that when I when I went into this project, um, I I felt that uh, my 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 personal experience, my situation was very different than the folks that I was speaking to. I was. I was uh, born and raised in Puerto Rico. I moved here to the States when I was 19. So everything from my childhood to my, my experiences growing up and sort of like developing as a person uh, were in Puerto Rico. Uh, and even though I've been in the States now for pretty much half of my life, uh, I wasn't really coming out of the same place, you know, in terms of the, my experience and my my idea of identity. You know, my, my idea of identity in this case is, is very... It's a lot more boring and very just stray shot in a way. <laughs> uh, but um, this this track I want to play for you is a track that I wrote. Uh, one of the things that I that I, that I that I that I was talking to them about a lot was about music, you know, of course, and and their relationship to music and how music had uh, in in most of their cases had ha created this sort of pathway, this uh, opened this door for them to be connected to to the the roots and, and uh, the, the upbringing of their parents and the grandparents that kind of brought them back, you know, even though they were here, the music would kind of connect them to a specific a specific thing that had to do with tradition and 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 for me, being here for so long and, and being a musician and uh, you know, the, 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 I felt I felt I, I related to to this, you know, in many ways because in 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 many ways, Puerto Rican music was you know, being over here was kind of what brought me, what connected me back to the island and what made me want to go back and listen to that music one more time, the music that I grew up with and really study it and try to get it into my own persona as a musician, as a creative artist and trying to find a way to uh, use this music as, as, a, as, a, as a vehicle to develop an identity, myself as a composer, as a player, you know. So, uh, when I was writing this, this when I was thinking about writing this piece, uh, I, I thought back to this this uh, this this song that my grandmother sang, sang to me when I was little, you know. And specifically, I picked this song because it's a, it's a three bar melody, you know. And I was like three bar, that's already like three and two, and all this stuff started going off in my head, you know. Uh, but the, it's a really sim simple melody. You you hear it when you hear the track, but it goes. She was saying this to me, kind of rocking me on her leg, you know, when I was little, and she and, and my mom was saying it to me. It's like something that's been passed in my family. I don't, I don't know where it comes from. It's probably some old song or something, uh, some old piano song or something. But uh, I thought of, of this little riff, and I and I put this riff in the uh, in the in the tune, like that's a. Uh, I sort of like the main motif, you know, main musical motif, and everything kind of builds on this tune, on this little riff, on this little riff, and the idea behind it, really, and this tune is called "Through Culture and Tradition," is our connection to, to music, but really our connection to, to tradition and how that brings us back into uh, the road to find our identity, you know, in this case, as Puerto Ricans or New Yorkers or, or whatever it may be. Uh, in this case, the, 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 the example that I, that I showed earlier, with the three and two, this tune specifically has that in it. And the way we use that on the tune, uh, I don't remember if I edited it out or not, but we use it to kind of create the impression that the tune is changing tempos, like it's become slower and faster, where it's really always in the same tempo. We just kind of use this little ratio to, to uh, play around with where the beat is, basically. That's, that would be a non-musical way to, to explain it, I think. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'll play for you, because it's a true cultural tradition. And through the music, I was able to understand, you know, my family, and understand the language, and understand, and understand the food, and, and but music was a starting point. Understanding from my dad and I, and I do I don't know if for glory stuff, but you know, all the stuff that's coming up with the people, the final music, everybody's music, that kind of opened the door to me understanding my family and understanding my past and understanding myself. 
question. Puerto Ricans do um, love their music, and it's, it's kind of what the celebration always gets surrounded by, by the Puerto Rican music. I absolutely feel that I, Puerto Ricans here were more interested in holding on to Aguinaldos and Buenas and folkloric music. Jazz too, which is a very hard form I love, but I don't know, I, have, I, have, I, have, I probably have in that case some more um, attraction to, to the uh, Puerto Rican art form, just because of um, my, when I was younger, that's what I heard a lot more. Yeah, what what I was playing is the album. Oh. Yeah, it's just you know you would you would be able to hear it, um, see it right. when you listen to it. But we also include it online so people can see this too. But yeah, the album has all the interviews included. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was wondering, you know, how people in the music world that you circulate in responded to this. You know, it's. It seems like something I'm not, you know, being ignorant. It seems like something really different to me to have the voices in there and to have the video going along with it too. And what have people thought? Yeah. Well, the reaction was interesting. Uh, some people weren't into the interviews at all. You know, like especially like jazz heads, they just kind of wanted to hear the music, and they were, they felt that the interviews were distracting. You know, uh, some people. Uh, especially people that were not coming out of the jazz world, uh, they enjoyed the, music, the interviews more than music, <laughs> or more than anything else, really. They just felt that that was really what spoke to them. Um, we just recently um, presented this project in Puerto Rico, which was sort of a big deal for me, you know, to be able to do it there. I mean, we presented it in New York a couple of times, but, and it was really great to see the reaction. I think um, it was, it was mixed also, but it was a different kind of mix, you know, because a lot of people there, like their perception of, of, 
of all this stuff is very vague, you know, like they really haven't experienced it firsthand or they don't really, you know, they don't really, uh, they don't really see it as an issue in a way. So it was really interesting to see how people reacted to it and people have reacted to seeing, you know, people, uh, you know, the people being interviewed on screen and going back to the music because we were playing the music live with the video, you know. Um, I think in general I would say that, that um, for me, what's been really great about it is that I was able to, um, to kind of like get it to a point where I was able to do it exactly the way I wanted to do it, you know, and, and kind of like have the interviews be as, as much there as I wanted to have the music be as much there as I wanted. It. And, and, uh, and we've actually um, gotten a lot of work from it, which is mm -hmm. usually a good sign. <laughs> And you've presented it different ways, yeah. right? You've mm -hmm. done it without the video. Yeah, In New yeah. York, you, I feel like you're presenting so it. So this music initially was written just for the quartet. What you heard is like a, like a large ensemble, like a big group of five saxophones, four trumpets, trombone, piano, bass, and drums, and myself. But when I first wrote the music, I wrote it just for myself, piano, bass, and drum, for my working band, you know? And we played it that way for a while. Uh, we sort of, you know, like sort of workshopped the music and got it to a point where we felt good with it. And then I took that, that music and orchestrated it for a large ensemble, you know, which is uh, how you heard it here. And like Erica said, we play it in many different ways because the music was written for a quartet initially. We played a lot as a quartet and it doesn't really change the music, you know, that much. Uh, we played with the quartet with the video, without the video, with, you know, with the interviews, without the interviews. And the same thing with the big band. We do it with the full group with the video and without the video is different of course different dynamic but it works because everything was kind of you know kind of prepared in, in layers kind of like in blocks that way yes when you say you got a lot of work out of this um i'm wondering whether i'm assuming you mean a lot of gigs yes right? <laughs> a lot of gigs It, it's, it's varied, you know, I mean, I think it, it, you really said it exactly the way it's been. Some people are totally into it, into the whole thing with the video, and some people are not into it. Some people can't afford it, you know, they can't afford a whole group, or they can't afford the video, they don't have a projector. Uh, a place to watch it, like, the whole thing. So it varies, you know, we've gone from every, everywhere from, like, Sanko Hall here in New York to, like, small club. Uh, obviously, when we, when we play in a small club, like we play at the Village Vanguard, we just play as a quartet, play the same music. We go into the theater, they have a projector, and they won the project this way. We do, we do it this way. One thing that was surprising to me is like we've really done it like a lot, like this way, like the full thing, a lot more than what I would like, what I thought it would be. I thought maybe we'll get to do it once or twice. And we've done it maybe eight or nine times with the full band and the video, and it's you know that's kind of the way it was conceived. So it's fun to do it, but it's also fun to experiment and we've done it a few times with just a quartet in the video which has been a different sort of dynamic too uh, and uh, when I said uh, that it's given, a, given us a lot of work for me usually that means that the project has gotten a lot of visibility uh, usually that's that kind of how it's translate like if you if you're working a lot it means that the project was out there and people were okay so usually presenters they they want to put something there that's that people know about already. So that, that's been a positive thing for us. Yes? First, first I want to commend you for what you did. Thank you. Because I've been listening to so much music in my life, and I've never heard a presentation like this. And I think it's, it takes it from just being a musical CD you know, to being a documentary. So yes. I want to commend you on that. Thank you. The one thing that surprised me, I had the privilege in 1978 the first musical group that came out of Cuba after the Imago, Grupo Moncada, the former head of the college, and they got permission to record them. And they explained the history of song, as well as that, and how that later evolved into salsa. Mm -hmm. so, and I always wonder, 
have a lot of friends from Puerto Rico who are from New York, the brother from the Palmetti brothers, and mm -hmm. Jose Fajardo, all these names that I'm sure you know, uh, grew up in that environment. There's very little talk in the Puerto community about the human roots of most of the music. And you didn't mention it either. But that's not your perspective for this particular project. I wonder again if with the people that you interviewed have you ever been able to did any of them talk about Cuba and so on? And yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've, I've, I've talked to it at length with Juan Flores, that's for sure, because we've talked about music for like two hours. And we went from everything from, you know, Chano Pozo in the early days of jazz to Arsenio Rodriguez and everybody, you know. And uh, I think what you, what you, what you talk about is uh, it's a really interesting topic on itself because of course, there's a rivalry, man. I mean, it's, it's just like what it is, you know. I mean, there's a rivalry. I mean, it's like you know, it's like no, man, we did it. No, you we did it first, you know, that kind of thing. And that's all. I mean, that's obviously gonna happen because you like. But but there's uh, there's also been a lot of uh, a lot of back and forth, you know. I mean, if you you would use you talked about salsa, and if you trace salsa and where it comes from, it's obvious where it comes from. But it's obvious also that it's grabbing from other places too, from a little funk and a little disco and a little here and that, you know. So uh, I think on on one way, uh, something like salsa, for example, would have never happened without Cuban music. But it wouldn't wouldn't have it wouldn't have happened either without the Puerto Ricans who were here in New York, right? So it's the kind of thing where like it's 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 it can't be like. Like sort of like black and white in in a sense that you could say, oh, this comes from here and that comes from here and that's ours and you know, because one thing, one one of the things and and for me it's been one of the greatest things that I've discovered just from listening to music and and just getting more into music is that, you know, like a lot of this music really belongs to everybody. You know, it's like you can find variations of the same ideas in a lot, of, so many different places. You start realizing it's all kind of coming out of the same place. You know, and you just kind of like. You know, here kind of grew up a different, you know, different way, and here grew up a, di a little bit of a different way. But in general, it's it's all the same, you know. One of the quick follow-up: Did you ever have a chance? To, I had a chance to spend some time with Eddie. Did you ever interview him? I think he's been so kind to me. No, I've never. I, I I spoke to him a couple of times, but I never gathered the courage to say, uh, "Let's sit down for an interview." <laughs> Well, you know, Juan actually, uh, Juan Flores was, was actually writing a book, a, a biography on Eddie mm -hmm. uh, before he passed. So maybe so, at some point that'll, that'll come out, mm -hmm. and I'm sure it's mm -hmm. amazing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. so you have something to say. <laughs> um, well, you know, I. I You're documenting, especially, I'm very, it's, so for me, it's very important work. And, and to include these voices, it, it, this is, this is, I think, it's going to be even, it's going to be like wine, it's going to age, it's going to mm. even be better. And, um, and so I, I, I personally knew like three, three of these, two, like Juan Flores, because I worked at the Center for Puerto Rican Studies, actually doing oral histories on the Puerto Rican community with, um, you know, garment workers, and, and you know, and it was very personal because I had to be my mother who was a garment worker. And then uh, Camilo e Molina, mm -hmm. his mother is a good friend of mine in the family. And who's the other one? Sonia Manzano, mm -hmm. I don't know, I guess we all grew up with her, so I don't know, but you know, actually, you know, I know her. But um, yeah, so it, it so the importance of this work. I, I just and so I'm listening to you know this brother here talking about you know the Cubans and this and that. Now it is true <laughs> that there is a rivalry, but as you well stated, and I will state it again, you know, it could not have been done without the experience of the Puerto Rican community in the Machito who married a Puerto Rican woman anyway, right? And and Mario Balsa, and you know, and, and everybody, and, and you know, I, and I, I disagree with this brother too because I said, and the source is Africa, the source of all of us is Africa. <laughs> but, 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 you know, I'm not musical, but you know, it, I, I just, it's fabulous work, and you, 
uh, are in a very special place because as a musician, you're gonna cre continue to create your music, but you're doing something else, which is also documenting that, uh, you know, that experience, and, and, and not that experience, that, um, that transformation of, of a very specific group of people, you know, in the New York Puerto Rican community. And it is just so, so, so valuable. And one has passed away recently, as I know, that you know. Uh, but, you know, he, he's had such an impact on my life and so many other people. And I think, as this brother says, you, you have to continue some of that work with Eddie Palmieri, for yeah. instance. I also knew Eddie Palmieri's brother, Charlie yeah, Palmieri, yeah. who is an excellent author and, and speaker. And he's, there are so many people like that. And do you know uh, the Sanabria, Bobby Sanabria? No, of course. Yes, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, there's a lot of work for you. I had the privilege of going to Cuba three times in the 1980s. And one of the things they did, you talk about the artists. Four times Cuba. They showed you, they have a show in which they bring out the African drummers to demonstrate the rhythm. And then the African drummers leave the stage. And then they bring out some Spanish string break. Mm -hmm. And they demonstrate the rhythm. Mm -hmm. And then they bring them all together and they give you salsa. Mm -hmm. And they do a song called Salsa Cubana. Mm -hmm. But they, it's not just the African rhythm, it's the African rhythm and the Spanish rhythm. So yeah, I really, we really, the two of us for sure, I want to see you get together with Ed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. On a different note, no pun intended, the light show is very evocative of 60 psychedelic light shows that accompany rock bands at that time and sort of put you in this other place as well. Was it informed based on that at all? What, what do you know about it? You know, I don't, I don't really know. I mean, I, I think that might be a little bit of a stretch, <laughs> but I, I could, I, I'll probably ask them tomorrow, you know, I mean, it might be. I mean, he's, uh, he, I don't think he was around in the 60s to go to a rock show, but he might, I know he's very, he's very informed about a lot of stuff that's out there. So I, I would be, I wouldn't be surprised if he knew about it and was influenced in some way. It was beautiful. I mean, there was a lot of images. There was the labyrinth and there was um, something that looked like uh, food, almost like french fries at one point. <laughs> Appendages, like a finger, um, and stained glass. Happening. Yeah, yeah. No, he filmed, uh, he filmed, I think he filmed pretty much in the street, you know? He filmed some flowers and some, like, I think he filmed like the this uh, glass at a train station in the Bronx and a couple other things. He went to a, to a music store and filmed the CD racks. I mean, mm -hmm. I, 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 a lot of times I can't really tell myself. I have to ask him, like, what is that? He would tell me, you know. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we put them both together, superimposed images, you know. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you about the Spanish rhythm and the Yeah, well, um, that was one of the things when I went into the project that I was trying to, I was trying to ponder whether to uh, use the interviews that way, you know, like really try to, use, like sort of like some of the work that's been done by uh, like Steve Reich and, and Phil Glass and, you know, like they kind of explored it that way where they, they take a phrase and, and, and kind of like turn it into musical notes or, or a specific rhythm. And, and eventually I decided that I wasn't going to do that uh, uh, like I was, I wasn't gonna focus on that. On some of the tracks I did, some of the tracks that I didn't play actually, I did use it in different ways. Uh, sometimes rhythmically, I would, I would sort of take an excerpt, and and I would kind of use it as a, as a kind of like an obstinato figure. On some of the other tracks, I used it as a, as a, almost as a, as a melodic kind of figure that would kind of change with the harmony. So I created the samples that I, I, you know, kind of transpose up and down, and they would change with the harmony. And when we play the show live, everything is, is live. So the video is everything. The video is, is sort of triggered, and also the samples are triggered, so I can control them 
depending on the tempo and depending on where I want to play them. Sometimes I play along with the samples. So I used it a little bit, but it wasn't, I've, I've never wanted it to be like the main thing. Like the, I, I really just wanted most of the interviews to be kind of like, almost like a soloist in a way, like kind of like just featured on their own. Spanish at all? Or no, no, I didn't. Uh, even though uh, some of, some of the people that I interviewed, they spoke, they speak Spanish very well. But I wanted to uh, do it in English just for just obvious reasons. You know, if we want to show it to an audience, I want to make sure that most people would understand it just right away. So. Yes. Um, you mentioned that one of your narrators um, basically identifies as black because other people identify her as black. Yeah. And, and, and as someone who's, I mean, I'm Chilean American, like, I, I, like I'm Latino, but I'm like a minority within the Latino community, and like among my friends, I'm seen as like, I don't know, more like, like I don't know, like I listen to hip hop, and so among my friends, like it's seen as like, oh, like I'd be like more black than other people. And anyway, so I'm just wondering, like, how how that might have like, come kind of So it it was one of the themes. Uh, it was actually one of the questions, one of the specific questions that I was asking everyone, uh, and it was. Uh, the, the questions sort of went around the uh, the idea of the uh, sort of like the relationship, like the historical relationship between the uh, the Puerto Rican community specifically in this case and the African American community in the city, right? And you could go back to salsa and hip hop and all kinds of stuff, right? And kind of like trace it up to today, you know? Uh, and I was really interested in this specifically because. Growing, uh, growing, I mean, uh, seeing my family here and how they, my brother and sister, they grew up here, and like in the case, like the the, the individual you you you're, you're talking about, what Erica mentioned before, is Camilo, the guy with the, mm -hmm. the baseball cap that was on the screen at the end, uh, uh, you know, like the way he dresses and the way he talks he, when he speaks English, he actually speaks Spanish perfectly, but when he speaks English and when he you know kind of like goes about his thing, uh, you know, he could go as a as a brother and you wouldn't you know you wouldn't really contest it, you know. So it's that kind of thing. And I was really curious about how um, the communities, specifically the Puerto Rican community, sort of, uh, you know, it was, it was this natural attraction to the African-American culture, music, you know, just uh, the, 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 the whole, you know, uh, everything that surrounds it, you know. And, and after a while, I realized that it had a lot to do with, you know, them being in the same place and you know being in the same neighborhoods and everything kind of mixing together, but this was something that I was curious about. And actually, one of the pieces that I didn't play uh, was a piece called "Same Fight," where we kind of it, it kind of kind of delves into this this idea. And a lot of the interviewees they they kind of you know go into it a little deeper. But it's, it was something that that I specifically wanted to tackle for sure. Because 
we did have a lot in common. We're living in the same places, struggling with the same issues about jobs and housing and, and healthcare and all of that. But, uh, it, you know, it's, it's very racist, you know, and Puerto Ricans can be very racist and still, you know, you know, there are sectors in Puerto Rico where that's why they reject some of us who come from New York because of the, all the racism, because, you know, we're, we're New Yorkers or whatever, you know. But the point is that with those discussions that I had with Juan, you know, made me realize, you know, that yes, there is that solidarity and that actually, no matter how much I rejected it, that black identity, not only based on skin color, and lips and you know whatever it was, but that it, that identity is something that I don't want people to mess with. That I have an identity as a black Puerto Rican woman, and look at me. And I was like shocked when one day on the subway, these little te teeny boppers were messing with me and said, you know, fuck you, white woman. And I said, white woman, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was like. <laughs> But the, that thing about uh, the identities um, and, you know, how we have these multiple identities that are, you know, very useful at different moments but, uh, mm -hmm. in, in how I really, because of my own racism and, and the racism within my own family, so I'm like, no, we're not like, you know, we're not black and we have plenty of problems with the blacks, you know, and as you mature and you, you know, you realize, wait a second, you know, you know, my skin is white, but my experience is as a non-white, and that's what you may sometimes experience as a Chileno, because, you know, and you, you know, maybe it, but it's that discrimination, the racism, whatever it is, but it, it, these conversations were so valuable in, in, in acceptance of, uh, you know, for myself, but not only for ourselves, but in terms of the Puerto Rican community and in terms of raising consciousness about what we can do to change, um, a, to change things, to make things better. And so Black Lives Matter, you know, yes, Black Lives Matter, all, all our, you know, our lives matter. And uh, it, it, it's just, you know, expressing solidarity and stuff. So, um, you know, I think this, topic, this thing about identities is so, so, so valuable and, and, uh, and it's, you know, it, it's not only about uh, Puerto Ricans and Blacks, but, but, you know, all of us, you know, have yeah, multiple uh, You know, one of, one of the things that, that I know one was really deep into was this idea that I think you brought up before of the Afro Latino, you know, and, and this was something that he was working for yes. ever. I mean, he had this Afro Latino reader, and him and his wife put it together, and he would do conferences, and 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 his whole idea was 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 kind of going back to what you were saying, you know, that uh, a lot of times uh, within within uh, uh, you know the, the Afri African American, this idea of the African American is is thought of as something that's exclusive of the United States. And, you know, we forget about Bahia and Brazil and uh, uh, Matanzas in Cuba and Loisa in Puerto Rico and all, all these pockets in all, in, in this, in, in all of our countries where the African uh, experience was very much alive and is still today, you know. Alive but invisible because there's so much racism. Yeah, in many ways, yeah. I mean, but but I think, I think part of his point was that uh, that you know, it it's it's there in, in all of us, you know. And as Puerto Ricans and Cubans and Americans, you know, we all have all that within us, you know. And and like you said, uh, part of the idea of of being in the same situations and the same struggles and the same fights, that's that what that's what makes you relate, especially being in a place like New York, you know. So that was that was I think that was powerful. You know? I'm wondering if, you know, I've heard people talk about oral history as being in some ways, oral history interviewing as being in some ways analogous to jazz in its sense of being sort of a structured improvisation. Um, and so I'm wondering about your experience trying out interviewing. Um, you know, you said this was the first time you had done that. Um, you know, what was it like for you? And did you feel like you were able to use any of your skills as a musician as you tried out that new? <laughs> I think we're probably just talking nonsense. So we, or, you know, making like a... Uh, a very drawn out analogy, but you you probably are better positioned to actually say if that makes sense than a lot of other people. Well, I mean, a lot of the some of the procedures were were similar, you know, in terms of like how how I kind of prepare for them and 
I kind of went into it with something that I wanted to do, but I was kind of leaving some space for other things that could happen, you know. And like I said, uh, I was very new to not necessarily interviewing. I mean, I, I've talked to people before and like you know, like gotten information, but in this case, I was going to use what I was gathering. I was going to eventually end up using some of these things and you know, mixing it with music. So I wanted to make sure that that it was usable and. Uh, and I have to say, the first couple of interviews, I, I, I really struggled, you know, because I didn't really, I, 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 I didn't, I was trying to create this balance, you know, between like getting my, I'm sure you, most of you know what I'm talking about, but trying to get my questions across, mm -hmm. but also like letting them be themselves and not like interrupting them and like <laughs> letting them, you know, express them. And, and if they want to talk about something else, then, you know, we can do that too. Uh, but after a while, it, it kind of got, a little more comfortable and I think it had a lot to do with the environment and also in, with the fact that I knew that I knew them you know that we knew each other previously and we could just like you know hang out and you know whatever talk about oh, you want some water I'll go get some water whatever you know get some lunch and blah blah you know it's, it ended up being this thing where like it was, it was more relaxed than, than at first I thought it was going to be a super uptight thing and I was uh, trying to be the <laughs> guy who interviewed and it ended up being this conversation which was super you know free flowing and cool Yeah, and kind of going back to it, I like, I think I mentioned it before, but sort of my main purpose when I went into it was that I wanted them to be comfortable. You know, like that was my biggest fear. I didn't want them not to be themselves. You know, so I was I was really just wanted to make sure that they were comfortable and they they felt like they could just say anything and be just themselves. You know, and I and, and that's because that was really what I wanted to capture. I didn't want to capture just some like preconceived like robotic robotic mm -hmm. you know <laughs> response you know to what I was so so I want to ask you because um, I, I'm, I'm considering myself an oral historian and I'm getting the master's degree in oral history um, and I want to ask you one if you consider yourself after doing this project an oral historian and two um, I just feel like what like, did you do any research about oral history before you did this work? Because it seems like you have some some similar uh, qualities as an oral historian, and you may not. It may it may be somewhat intuitive, um, and I want to know what what that process is and, and how you see yourself in that as in this place of oral historians. Uh, I didn't do any research at all, and actually, to be honest with you, uh, I had heard very little of the term before Erica mm -hmm. contacted me. <laughs> and afterwards, of course, I mean, I've, I've, found, I've heard more about it and researched a little more. And actually, my wife is in academia a little bit, so she knew about it. And, you know, she kind of filled me in. But, um, you know, I, um, I really just went into the project really blindly. I mean, I, I, I got lucky in many ways because I kind of got what I wanted to get out of it, but it could it have could pretty much been a disaster too, you know. <laughs> it could have been something that could have, you know, I, could, I would have had to throw in the garbage just because it was no no use. So uh, I, I went into it, you know, blindly but with a lot of curiosity and, and, and you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know if I was going to consider myself a historian or whatever from now on, but I definitely learned a lot from it, you know, I learned a lot and I, I I, I sort of gather a lot of respect for the people who do this a lot, you know. I was wondering if this project has resonated in any work you've done since then, um, or if you think you might use any of these techniques again, or return to these themes, or... Um, I haven't done a lot after this, you know. <laughs> I've been kind of like doing this, doing this uh, recently, but um, 
like I said, you know, I I um, I learned a lot from it, and and if I was gonna do something like this again or something similar, uh, I would uh, I, I say that I'm a lot more experienced now than I was when I went into this. You know, I mean, I I uh, I, I, I like I, I I got a lot of things that came out right, but a lot of things that I could have done different or I might do different if I did it again. You know, so. We'll see. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 uh, I, I, I'm one of those people who thinks very short term, so I, I can't really see that far. But I'm, I don't, I don't reject the idea of doing something similar in the future. Yeah. We'll be watching. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. Thank you very much. Um, I'm South African, and I really resonate so strongly with, um, with not just how you kind of integrated the, the narrative these various narratives around, um, around identities. In South Africa, you know, we, we have a very strong jazz culture. And one of the offshoots of that jazz culture is called Guma, which also integrates um, exiled Malays and indo Malays that were brought in by the Dutch about 500 years ago. And that then is kind of integrated uh, again with Portuguese influence coming from Mozambique, um, and then various new Guinea uh, cultures in Europe, which also have a very kind it's, jazz has been used as both a liberation tool as part of the liberation struggle. Um, and to this day, uh, it's, it's always moving because of, you know, of this need of, of trying to locate. There was a transient sense of location. Um, and I think you know, this, this particular post, what you've done, uh, I, I also feel is a really um, a very strong kind of a, you know, a method in a way that I, 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 I really feel can be, can be utilized in other places around the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that it's not just relevant solely within, within the Caribbean, Papua Caribbean mm -hmm. context, but I, I think that um, something like this can, can form part of a methodology um, that can assist in, in this need of, of the quest of, of identity mm -hmm. and how that identity is continuously shifting, especially in the pop, uh, post of that's Thank great. you so much. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Thanks. Do you have any clothes? Not really. But thank well, you thank so you much, Miguel. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.